I'm Jan Galinsky. I'm a historian of chemistry here at the Chemical Heritage Foundation and I'm going to talk to you about Joseph Priestley's experimental apparatus. What we have here is a reproduction of the laboratory apparatus that Priestley used to discover several new gases, or as he called them, airs, in the 1770s. And you'll see that it's extremely simple apparatus, really just household objects. Uh, we have some very simple glassware, uh, tubes, uh, a little bottle, um, a glass, which could be a wine glass or a beer glass. Um, and these are placed in this basin, which is filled with water. Uh, and the tubes and vessels can also be filled with water so that the gases can be fed under the water and into the tubes, displacing the water in the tubes. And that's the way in which you produce and isolate a gas yeah. that you want to study. The apparatus is extremely simple. Uh, and in fact, it was important to Priestley that it should be simple because it was one of the principles of his scientific work that experiments should be as widely reproducible as possible. And so simple apparatus was important to that end. Along with the uh, simple apparatus, Priestley used various techniques to identify and characterize the gases that he discovered. One of his most important and famous discoveries was the gas that we call oxygen, which Priestley called dephlogisticated air, uh, and he discovered that in 1774. And he characterized that air as better than normal atmospheric air for breathing, for respiration. And the way he found out that his so-called dephlogisticated air was better than normal air for breathing was by using an assistant in the laboratory in the form of a mouse. Uh, Priestley placed mice in the receivers for his gases to test the, the quality of the gases by how long the mouse could survive. And he found that a mouse placed in a receiver of dephlogisticated air or oxygen could survive longer than a mouse placed in a receiver of normal atmospheric air. So that showed to Priestley that this air was of higher quality than normal atmospheric air. Now, Priestley's use of mice in these experiments was somewhat controversial. Uh, he wasn't by any means a cruel man, but uh, a lot of his mice did die in the course of the experiments, and he had to keep catching new mice uh, as long as he continued his experiments. One of Priestley's friends, uh, a poet named Anna Letitia Barbo, wrote a short poem uh, in which she imagined herself speaking in the voice of one of these mice that Priestley had placed in his vessel to test the quality of the gas. The poem is a rather nice one because it, it specifically touches upon Priestley's reputation as a champion of human rights and human liberty. And it imagines how a mouse might ask Priestley for his liberty in these circumstances. So this is a couple of verses from the poem. If e'er thy breast with freedom glowed and spurned a tyrant's chain, let not thy strong oppressive force a free-born mouse detain. The cheerful light, the vital air, are blessings widely given. Let nature's commoners enjoy the common gifts of heaven. And in fact, Priestley did find a way to liberate the mice from his experiments. He discovered another chemical reaction using one of the gases he, d he had discovered, uh, what he called nitrous air, we would call nitric oxide. And he discovered by combining that air with the air that he wanted to test and measuring the diminution of volume as the gases reacted with one another, he could find 
another way to measure the suitability of that gas for respiration. And so he was in fact able to liberate the mice from his experiments. If you'd like to know more about Joseph Priestley and his experiments, please visit the museum at the Chemical Heritage Foundation in Philadelphia or visit us online at chemheritage.org. My name's Jan Golinski. Thank you for watching.